<laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone, and welcome to Conk's Corner, the show where I check in if you've been a bad boy or girl or a good boy or girl. It's me, Santa Claus in the flesh. Oh, I sent out all of my elves to give the presents tonight. <laughs> they, they, they are... It's on their way as we speak, and they can't be COVID infected because I'm sick. <laughs> Gotta stay at home. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, so this is the, the show where uh, John, he can't be here right now. John reads uh, Harry Potter to you, and he has never read it before, so please don't spoil anything. Don't wreck anything with spoilers in the chat or the comments because that's no fun. So before, before I get, before I get it, uh, John back here, I uh, just wanted to say, if you're alone this Christmas, you are loved, you have value, and you have meaning. All right, I'm going to go get John. Hey, hey, John, get over here, get off, John. Wait. Yeah, what is it? John, they're waiting for you on the stream. Oh, I, yeah, okay, okay, here I come. See you later, Santa. Thanks for dropping by. Love you. Whoa. Santa was uh, just visiting. I know he's my circle. He's my plus one circle of uh, this place. <laughs> Please do the whole show as Santa trying to read and do voices. Yeah, right. Okay, wait, this is getting really loud uh, uh, because I, I tried something out and it just got really loud. Okay, there we go. Welcome. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. I hope you're you're n n n nestled up with what, some warm eggnog or, or glühwein or whatever you like drinking. Got some cookies on hand, maybe some milk to dunk those cookies in, and some presents underneath the tree that you have given to others or others have given to you. I hope you're making this evening somehow special for yourself, because that's what I'd like to do for you. And uh, we are going to read some Harry Potter tonight. It might not be as cheery and Christmassy. It's probably going to be tragic somewhere within that. I don't know if it's going to end on any sad notes. Probably. But uh, <laughs> the, the surrounding things <laughs> should be a bit Christmassy. Um, okay. So uh, last time we left off where Neville came out of the picture. Neville all scraggly and, and uh, he was hiding somewhere, I guess. So, you, uh, Erika says I'm drinking Julmust, a Swedish special soda on Christmas. I've never heard of that. I would love to try some Julmust. Ju Julmust. <laughs> I have ice cream. Somebody has a small black Russian drink for me tonight. Jameson and Coke for, for Thomas. Melchorel slept through the entire day so the stores were closed when he woke up. I didn't have food for Christmas Day so things are going well here. Oh, Mel! Mel, get some crackers or something. Anything. Get butter, beer for cereal. Uh, listening while I start uh, prep prepping Christmas dinner. Okay. Well, I know it's probably going to get more intense and more intense and intense and intense as we go on. Uh, I need a little bit of your help tonight. I would like to read for an hour until 7 o'clock when I'm going to have a little Christmas Zoom with my family. But uh, I don't want to end in the middle of a fantastic scene or something crazy good is happening. So I need a little bit of your help. If we're getting to 6.50, 6.55 and there is a good mid-scene or end-scene part to end, even if it's five minutes earlier, please let me know, because I don't want to end on something that's really exciting. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I got a little whiskey, too. Gross beard stuff from the Santa beard. All right, let's get going. <coughs> so call out when there's a good place to stop. Yes, please. Maybe uh, call it out and... Lois or... I think Lois can only be on for half an hour, but Lois or one of the other mods will tell me what the general consensus is. So thank you very much, everybody. Much love to you. Let's get started. Chapter 29. The Lost Diadem. Neville, 
Oh, wait, I'd probably change it from Christmas music. Eh? Uh, I'll just change it to the regular music, or maybe to... There we go, I'll change it to this. I'm here till 7 tonight. Okay, awesome. Neville, what the... Uh, how? But Neville had spotted Ron and Hermione, and with yells of delight was hugging them too. The longer Harry looked at Neville, the worse he appeared. One of his eyes was swollen, yellow and purple. There were gouge marks on his face, and his general air of unkemptness suggested that he had been living rough. Oh, also, I got new lights for, for Christmas. Somebody gave me some lights, and they're really fun. I can do, do a lot of fun things with them. Uh, they, they change like every, anything else. Anyway, just, just that's new. Um... <clears throat> His face was swollen, yellow, and purple. There were gouge marks on his face, and his general air of unkemptness suggested that he had been living rough. Nevertheless, his battered visage, I know it's visage, but I like saying it visage, visage, shone with happiness as he let go of Hermione and said, I knew you'd come, kept telling Se Seamus it was a matter of time. Neville, what's happened to you? What? This? Neville dismissed his injuries with a shake of the head. This is nothing. Seamus is worse. You'll see. Shall we get going then? Oh, he turned to Aberforth. Ab, there might be uh, there might be a couple more people on the way. What? 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 Okay, this is all all new. A <coughs> uh, couple more, repeated Aberforth ominously. What do you mean, a couple more, Longbottom? There's a curfew and caterwauling charm on the whole village. I know. That's why they'll be apparating directly into the bar, said Neville. Just send them down the passage when you get here, will you? Thanks a lot. Neville held out his hand to Hermione and helped her to climb up onto the mantelpiece and into the tunnel. I'm still a bit confused. Is this a painting where a person who's died lives? Or is this an actual tunnel? Or is this both? I'm a bit confused. Um, Harry addressed Aberforth. I don't know how to thank you. You saved our lives, twice. Look after them, then, said Aberforth gruffly. I might not be able to save them a third time. Harry clambered up onto the mantelpiece and through the hole behind Ariana's portrait. It's both. Okay, thank you. There's a tunnel behind the painting. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Harry clam uh, there were smooth stone steps on either side. It looked as though the passageway had been there for years. Brass lamps hung from the walls, and the earthy floor was worn and smooth. As they walked, their shadows rippled fan-like across the wall. How long has this been here? Ron asked as they set off. It isn't on the Marauder's map, is it, Harry? I thought there were only seven passages in and out of school. They sealed off all of those before the start of the year, said Neville. There's no chance of getting through any of them now, not with curses over the entrances and Death Eaters and Dementors waiting at the exits. I think that's a good grown-up voice for him, right? Because when he was small, it's very much like this, so he's grown up a bit and he's talking more like this. He started walking backwards, beaming, drinking them in. <sighs> Never mind that stuff. Is it true? Did you break into Gringotts? Did you escape on a dragon? It's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it. Terry Boot got beaten up by Caro for yelling about it in the Great Hall at dinner. Yeah, it's true, said Harry. Neville laughed gleefully. <laughs> what did you do with the dragon? Released it into the wild, said Ron. Hermione was all for keeping it as a pet. Don't exaggerate, Ron. Um, but what have you been doing? People have been saying you've just been on the run, Harry. But I don't, but I don't think so. I think you've been up to something. You're right, said Harry. But tell us about Hogwarts, Neville. We haven't heard anything. Oh, it's been... Well, it's not really like Hogwarts anymore, said Neville, the smile fading from his face as he spoke. Do you know about the Carrows? Those two Death Eaters who teach there. They do more than teach, said Neville. They're in charge of all discipline. They like punishment, the Carrows. Like Umbridge? No. Oh, they make her look tame. The other teachers are all supposed to refer us to the Carrows if we do anything wrong. 
They don't, though, if they can avoid it. You can tell them all, you can tell they all hate them as much as we do. Amic, uh, sorry, it's a beard from the, beard from the Santa beard. I'm stuck in my mouth, there it is, it's gone. <laughs> <clears throat> um, where were we? Amicus, the bloke, uh, he teaches what used to be defense against the dark arts. Except now it's just a dark, it's the dark arts. <laughs> We're supposed to practice the cruciatus curse on, on people of earned detentions. What? Harry, Ron, and Hermione's united voices echoed up and down the passage. Yeah, said Neville. That's how I got this one. He pointed at a particular deep gash in his cheek. I, re I refuse to do it. Some people are into it, though. Crabbe and Goya love it. First time they've ever been topping anything, I expect. Uh, Electo, Amicus' sister, teaches muggle studies, which is compulsory for everyone. We've all got to listen to her explain how muggles are like animals. Stupid and dirty. And how they drove wizards into hiding by being vicious towards them and how the natural order is being re-established. I got this one, he indicated another slash to his face, for asking her how much muggle blood she and her brother have got. Blimey, Neville, said Ron. There's a time and a place for getting a smart mouth. <laughs> you didn't hear her, said Neville. You wouldn't have stood it either. The thing is, it helps when people stand up to them. It gives everybody hope. I used to notice that when you did it, Harry. Get out of here. That's too much. That feel is too much right now. I'm feeling emotional. I'm feeling emotional about Neville. I really am. Oh man, he's making me tear up. It's it's so beautiful. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> that is so he's too much. He's grown like crazy. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> that is so cute and just his character he's being like a leader he's being a leader that's what I think that's what make, what's moving me is is like he's a, he's a being a leader right now he, he he watched Harry 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 was one of the people who helped him out and because of that he overcome some things and he's become a leader it's just beautiful Oh, yeah, yeah. Finally, John teared up at something. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it, you know what gets me? It's not necessarily super shocking moments. Somebody dies, although that's tragic. It's an arc. It's how people evolve and change. That's what gets me. And that's obviously just a small portion of it, but it's beautiful. We now, we, we now, we now level. We love Neville. This is pretty much the climax of the series, <laughs> says Nathan. Pretty much the climax of the series. Series. That's so funny. All right, let's keep going. Um, but they've used you as a knife sharpener, said Ron, wincing slightly as they passed a lamp, and Neville's injuries were thrown into even greater relief. Neville shrugged. I, I think I might just be feeling emotional that today, too. It's Christmas, can't be with the family, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, doesn't matter. They don't want to spill too much pure blood, so they'll torture us a bit if we're mouthy, but they won't actually kill us. Harry did not know what was worse, the thing that Neville was saying, or the matter-of-fact tone in which he said them. The only people in real danger are the ones whose friends and relatives on the outside are giving trouble. They get taken hostage. Old Zeno Lovegood was getting a bit too outspoken in the quibbler, so they dragged Luna off the train on the way back for th on the tr way back for cr for, uh, for Christmas. Neville, she's all right. We've seen her. Yeah, I know. Uh, she managed to get a message to me. From his pocket, he pulled a golden coin, and Harry recognized it as one of the fake galleons that Dumbledore's army had used to send one another messages. Don't take this from Neville, John. It's all Neville that makes you emotional. Yeah, it's true, too. It's just part of it. <clears throat> um, 
From his pocket, he pulled a golden coin, and Harry recognized that as one of the fake galleons that Dumbledore's army had used to send one another messages. These have been great, said Neville, beaming at Hermione. The Carrows never rumbled how, uh, rumbled how we were communicating. It drove them mad. We used to sneak out at night and put graffiti on the walls. Dumbledore's army, still recruiting. <laughs> Stuff like that. Oh, Snape hated it. You used to, said Harry, who had noticed that past sense. You used to? You son of a gun, why aren't you still doing it now? Well, it got more difficult as time went on, said Neville. We lost Loon at Christmas, and Ginny never came back after Christmas. And the three of us were sort of the leaders. The Carrows seemed to know I was behind a lot of it, so they started coming down on me hard. And then Michael Corner went and got caught, releasing a first year they chained up. And they tortured him pretty badly. That scared people off. No kidding muttered Ron, as the passage began to slope upwards. Yeah, well, I couldn't ask people to go through what Michael did, so we dropped those kinds of stunts. But we were still fighting, doing underground stuff, right up until a couple of weeks ago. That's when they decided they were only, there was only one way to stop me, I suppose. And they went for Gran. They what? said Harry, Ron, and Hermione together. Yeah, said Neville, panting a little now, because the passage was climbing so steeply. Well, you can see their thinking. It had worked really well, kidnapping kids to force their relatives to behave. I suppose it was only a matter of time before they did it the other way around. Thing was, he faced them, and Harry was astonished to see that he was grinning. They bit off a bit more than they could chew with Gran. <laughs> Little old witch living alone. They probably thought they didn't need to send anyone particularly powerful. Anyway, <laughs> Neville laughed. <laughs> Dawlish is still in St. Mungo's. <laughs> and Gran's on the run. She sent me a letter. <laughs> no way, that's so funny. He clapped a hand to the breast pocket of his robes, telling me she was proud of me, that I'm my parent's son. And to keep it up. Oh! Oh! It's too much! It's too much, Neville! It's too much! Uh, cool, said Ron. Ah, granny, granny, granny. Kicking ass! Yeah, said Neville happily. Only thing is, once they realized they had no hold over me, they decided Hogwarts could do without me after all. I don't know whether they were planning to kill me or send me to Azkaban, either way. I knew it was time to disappear. Um, but, said Ron, looking thoroughly confused, aren't Aren't we heading straight back into Hogwarts? Of course, said Neville. You'll see. We're here. They turned a corner, and there ahead of them was the end of the passage. Another short flight of... <laughs> I was just thinking... <laughs> I was just thinking how funny it would be if in the final battle, whatever is happening at the end, people are like dueling. I guess they're all zapping each other, running around, people dying left, right, and center. And there's like a momentous moment where Neville has to like step up and be a leader and do something big and it just goes back to book one he just like trips over his frog and just stumbles down the stairs and everyone starts watching him <laughs> that'd be so funny uh, all right He, he could have changed it all. He could have saved everything. He was like, oh, 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 <laughs> oh, oh, man. That'd be so funny. <laughs> all right. Um, they turned a corner, and there ahead of them was the end of the passage. Another short flight of steps led to a door just like the one hidden behind Ariana's portrait. Neville pushed it open and climbed through. As Harry followed, he heard Neville call out to unseen people. Look who it is! Look who it is! Didn't I tell you? As Harry emerged into the room beyond the passage, there were several screams and yells. Harry! It's Potter! It's, 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 it's Potter! Run! Hermione! He had a confused impression of colored hangings, of lamps and many faces. The next moment, he, Ron, and Hermione were engulfed, hugged, pounded on the back, their hair ruffled, their hands shaken by what seemed to be more than 20 people. 
They might have just won a Quidditch final. Okay, okay, calm down, Neville called. And as the crowd backed away, Harry was able to take in their surroundings. He did not recognize the room at all. It was enormous and looked rather like the interior of a particularly sumptuous treehouse, or perhaps a gigantic ship's cabin. Multicolored hammocks were strung from the ceiling and from a balcony that ran around the dark wood paneled and windowless wa walls, which were covered in bright tapestry hanging. Harry saw the gold Gryffindor lion, emblazoned on scarlet, the black badger of Hufflepuff set against yellow, and the bronze eagle of Ravenclaw on blue. The silver and green of Slytherin alone were absent. There were bulging bookcases, a few broomsticks propped against the walls, and in the corner, a large, wooden-cased wireless. Where are we? Room of requirement, of course, said Neville. Surpass itself, hasn't it? The Caros were chasing me, and, and uh, I knew I had just one chance for a hideout. I managed to get through the door, and this is what I found. Well, it isn't exactly like this when I arrived. It was a load smaller. There was only one hammock and just Gryffindor hangings. But it's expanded as more and more of the DA have arrived. And the Carrows can't get in? Asked Harrow, looking around for the door. No, said Seamus, 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 Seamus Finnegan, whom Harry had not recognized until he spoke. <clears throat> Seamus's face was bruised and puffy. It's a proper hideout, as long as one of the, as long as, uh, sorry, as long as one, one of, uh, what, as long as one of us stays in here, they can't get at, it. they can't get at us. The door won't open. It's all down to Neville. He really gets this room. You've got to ask it for exactly what you need. Like, I don't want any Caro supporters to be able to get in, and it'll do it for you. You've just got, uh, you've just got to make sure you close the loopholes. Neville's the man. Ne Neville's the man. Oh, that was kind of all over the place. <laughs> it's quite straightforward, really, said Neville modestly. I've been in here about a day and a half and getting really hungry and wishing I could get something to eat. And that's when the passage to the Hogshead opened up. I went through it and met Aberforth. He's been pr providing us with food because for some reason, that's the one thing the room doesn't really do. Um... Yeah, well, food's one of the five exceptions to Gamp's law of elemental transfiguration, said Ron, to general astonishment. Yeah, why would he know that? <laughs> John, did you ever think Neville's the man would be a quote in this series? I did not. I, I just thought he'd be a general clown for most of the series, which he is in the first, what is it, three, four books, until you get some of his backstory. I, I just thought he'd be like the, the guy that to, to have fun fun with. <laughs> All right. So we've been hiding uh, out here for nearly two weeks, said Seamus. And it just makes more hammocks every time we need them. And it even spouted a pretty good bathroom once girls started turning up. <laughs> oh, Lavender Brown's back. And <laughs> and thought they'd quite like to wash. Yes, supp supplied Lavender Brown, whom Harry had not, not noticed until this point. Now that he looked around properly... He recognized many familiar faces. Both Patil twins were there, as were Terry Boot, Ernie McMillan, Anthony Goldstein, and Michael Corner. Michael Corner. <laughs> I don't know what that name's so funny. Tell us what you've been up to, though, said Ernie. They, they've been so, they, uh, there have been so many rumors. We've been trying to keep up with you on the Potter Watch, he pointed at the wireless. You didn't break into Kringets. They did, said ne Neville, and the dragon's true, too. There was a smattering of applause and a few whoops. Ron took a bow. What were you after? Asked Seamus eagerly. Before any of them could parry the question with one of their own, Harry felt a terrible scorching pain in the lightning scar. As he turned his back hastily on the curious and delighted faces, the room of requirement vanished, and he was standing inside a ruined stone shack, and the rotting floorboards were ripped apart at his feet. A, dis a dis dis disinterred golden box lay open <clears throat> beside the hole, and Voldemort's scream of fury vibrated inside his head. Wait, where is he? 
And he was standing inside a ruined stone shack. Oh, oh, okay. Ah, he found out that the ring has been vanquished. Awesome. Michael's Corners, Conk's Corners Cousin. <laughs> oh, there should be a show called Conk's Corners Cousin Michael. Uh, Conk's Corners Cousin Michael Corner. With an enormous effort, he pulled out of Voldemort's mind again, back to where he stood, swaying in the room of requirement, sweat pouring from his face, and Ron holding him up. Are you all right, Harry? Neville was saying. Want to sit down? Expect you're tired, aren't huh? No, said Harry. He looked at Ron and Hermione, trying to tell them without words that Voldemort had just discovered the loss of one of the other Horcruxes. Time was running out fast. If Voldemort chose to visit Hogwarts next, they would miss their chance. We need to get going, he said, and their expressions told him that they understood. Uh, what are we going to do then, Harry? asked Seamus. What's the plan? Plan, repeated Harry. He was exercising all his willpower to prevent himself succumbing again to Voldemort's rage. His scar was still burning. Well... There's something we, Ron, Hermione, and I, and I, need to do, and then we'll get out of here. Nobody was laughing or whooping anymore. Neville looked confused. What do you mean, get out of here? We haven't come back to stay, said Harry, rubbing his scar, trying to soothe the pain. There's something important we need to do. What is it? I, I, I can't tell you. There's a rippling ripple of muttering at this. Neville's brows contracted. What? Why can't you tell us? It's something to do with fighting you know who, right? Well, yeah, then we'll help you. The other members of Dumbledore's army were nodding, some enthusiastically, others solemnly. A couple of them rose from their chairs to de demonstrate their willingness for immediate action. You don't understand. Harry seemed to have said that a lot in the last few hours. We... We can't tell you. We've got to do it alone. Why? asked Neville. B -b because, in his desperation to start looking for the missing Horcrux, or at least to have a private discussion with Ron and Hermione about where they might commence their search, Harry found it difficult to gather his, his thoughts. His scar was still searing. Dumbledore left the three of us a job, he said carefully. And... We weren't supposed to tell. I mean, he wanted us to do it. Just the three of us. We're his army, said Neville. Dumbledore's army. We were all in it together. We've been keeping it going while you three have been off on, you, off on your own. It hasn't exactly been a picnic, mate, said Ron. I never said it had. But I don't see why you can't trust us. Everyone in this room's been fighting. And they've been driving in here because the Carrow's been hunting them down. Everyone in here's proven they're loyal to Dumbledore. Loyal to you. Look, Harry began, without knowing what he was going to say. But it did not matter. The tunnel door had just opened behind him. Um, Luna and Dean. We got your message, Neville. Hello, you three. I thought you must be here. It was Luna and Dean. I love Luna. Seamus gave a great roar of delight and ran to hug his best friend. Hi, everyone. <coughs> My voice is still a little raspy. Said Luna happily. Oh, it's great to be back. Luna, said Harry distractedly. What, 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 what are you doing here? How did you... I sent for her, said Neville, holding up the fake galleon. Luna and Neville are going to end up together. That's what I think. They're going to end up together. They'd be perfect for each other. They'd be perfect for each other. I don't know if they will, but that's what I'm going for. Um... <clears throat> I sent for her, said Neville, holding up the fake galleon. I promised her and Ginny that if you turned up, I'd let them know. We all thought that if you came back, it would mean revolution. 
that we were going to overthrow Snape and the Carrows. Of course that's what it means, said Luna brightly. Isn't it, Harry? We're going to fight them out of Hogwarts. Listen, said Harry, with a rising sense of panic. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's not what we came back for. There's something we've got to do, and then... I forget Michael Corner's voice. What does a corner sound like? <laughs> corner in. You're going to leave us in this mess, demanded Michael Corner. He's he squashed in. You're going to leave us in this mess, demanded Michael Corner. No, said Ron. What we're doing will benefit everyone in the end. It's all about trying to get rid of you-know-who. Then let us help, said Neville angrily. We want to be part of it. There was another noise behind them, and Harry turned. What does a corner sound like? <laughs> um, his heart seemed to fail. Ginny was now climbing through the hole in the wall. Ginny, Ginny, Ginny. Closely followed by Fred, George, and Lee Jordan. Ginny gave Harry a radiant smile. He had forgotten, or had never fully appreciated, how beautiful she was. And he had never been less pleased to see her. This track right now is very beautiful. I love this track. Aberforth's getting a bit ratty, said Fred, raising his hand in answer to several cries of greeting. He wants a kitten, and his bars turned into railway station. <laughs> Harry's mouth fell open. Right behind Lee Jordan came Harry's old girlfriend, Cho Chang. <laughs> What's going on? What is going on? She smiled at him. I got the message, she said, holding up her own fake galleon, and she walked over to sit beside Michael Corner. So, what's the plan, Harry? said George. There isn't one, said Harry, still disoriented, dis disorientated by the sudden appearance of all these people, unable to take everything in while his scar was still burning so fiercely. Just going to make it up as we go along, are we? <laughs> My favorite kind, said Fred. You've got to stop this, Harry told Neville. What did you call them ba all back for? This is insane. But we're fighting, aren't we? said Dean, taking back his fake galleon. The message was the message said Harry w was back, and we were going to fight. I'll have to get a wand, though. You haven't got a wand, began Seamus. Ron turned suddenly to Harry. Why can't they help? What? They can help. He dropped his voice and said so that none of them could hear but Hermione, who stood by between them. We don't know where it is. We've got to find it fast. We don't have to tell them it's a Horcrux. Harry looked from Ron to Hermione, who murmured, I think Ron's right. We don't even know what we're looking for. We need them. And when Harry looked unconvinced, We don't have to do everything alone, Harry. Harry thought fast, his scar still prickling, his head threatening to split again. Dumbledore had warned him against telling anyone but Ron and Hermione about the Horcruxes. Secrets and lies. That's how we grew up. And Albus. No, no. Secrets and lies. That's how we grew up. And Albus. He was a natural. Was he turning into Dumbledore? Keeping his secrets clutched to his chest? Afraid to trust? But Dumbledore had trusted Snape. And where had that led? To murder at the top of the highest tower. All right, he said quietly to the other two. Okay, he called to the room at large, and all noise ceased. Fred and George, who had been cracking jokes for the benefit of those nearest, fell silent. And all of them, all of them looked alert, excited. Everybody wants to join in. Hogwarts family reunion. Make it up as we go along is Harry's, Harry's motto. Very true, Mo. Mo. The DA has a point. Why can't they help? I mean, I agree. You don't have to tell them the secrets, but he never said nobody can help them, right? Uh, he called to the room at large and all noise ceased. Fred and George, who had been cracking jokes for the benefit of those nearest, fell silent. And all of, all of them looked alert, excited. There's something we need to find, Harry said. Something, something that'll help us overthrow you-know-who. It's here at Hogwarts, but we don't know where. 
It might have belonged to Ravenclaw. Has anyone heard of an object like that? Has anyone ever come across something with her eagle on it, for instance? He looked hopefully towards the little group of lip Ravenclaws, to Padma, Michael, Terry, and Cho. But it was Luna who answered. <clears throat> <coughs> Perched on the arm of Ginny's chair. Well, there, there's her lost diadem. I told you about it, remember, Harry? The lost diadem of Ravenclaw. Daddy's trying to duplicate it. Yeah, but the lost diadem, said Michael Corner, rolling his eyes, is lost, Luna. That's all the point. <laughs> Michael Corner. When was it lost? What's a diadem again? I completely forget. Let's look this word up. The diadem is a jeweled crown or headband worn as a... Oh, right. The symbol of so, so, uh, so, sovereign, sovereignty? So, sovereignty. Ah. Ah, wow. Okay. The tiara, crown, right. Oh. Uh, when was it lost? asked Harry. Centuries ago, they say, said Cho, and Harry's heart sank. Professor Flitwick says the diadem vanished with Ravenclaw herself. People have looked, but she appealed to her fellow Ravenclaws. Nobody's ever found a trace of it, have they? They all shook their heads. Sorry, but what is a diadem? asked Ron. <laughs> you know, the more I read this book, the more I think I'm Ron. <laughs> I like to eat. <laughs> I'm consistently confused about what people are saying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> and I just I just want things to be simple. <laughs> uh, uh Terry Boot. I forget Terry Boot's voice. It's a kind of crown, said Terry Boot. Ravenclaw is supposed to have magical properties, enhance the wisdom of the wearer. Uh, yeah, you're definitely Ron. You're totally Ron. Ron just asked your question. This has never been a mystery to us, Ron. Ron Reedsley. And you're always hungry? Yes, all the time. I want to eat all the time. All right. <clears throat> uh, well, let's see here. Terry Boot, Ravenclaw supposed to have magical profit properties enhance the wisdom of the wearer. Yes, Daddy Raxpert siphons, but Harry cut across Luna. And none of you have ever seen anything looks that looks like it. They all shook their heads again. Harry looked at Ron and Hermione, and his own disappointment was mirrored back at him. An object that had been lost this long, and apparently without trace, did not seem like a good candidate for the horcrux hidden in the castle. Before he could formulate a new question, however, Cho spoke again. If you'd like to see what the diadem's supposed to look like, I could take you up to our common room and show you, Harry. Ravenclaw's wearing it in her statue. Harry's scar scorched again. For a moment, the room of requirements swam before him, and he saw instead the dark earth soaring beneath him and felt the great sna snake wrapped around his shoulders. Voldemort was flying again. Whether to the underground lake or here to the castle, he did not know. Either way, there was hardly any time left. He's on the move, he said quietly to Ron and Hermione. He glanced at Cho and then back at them. Listen, I, I know it's not much of a lead, but I'm going to go and look at the statue, at least to find out what the diadem looks like. Wait for me here and keep, you know, the others safe. Cho got to her feet, but Ginny said rather fiercely, No, Luna will take Harry, won't you, Luna? Oh, she got some jealousy. She got some jealousy. <clears throat> oh, yes, I'd like to, said Luna happily, and Cho sat down again, looking disappointed. How do we get out? Harry asked Neville. Over here. He led Harry and Luna to a corner, where a small cupboard opened on to a steep staircase. It comes out somewhat different every day, so they've ne never been able to find it, he said. Our only trouble is, we never know exactly where we're going to end up when we go out. 
Be careful, Harry. They're always patrolling the corridors at night. No problem, said Harry. See you in a bit. He and Luna hurried up the staircase, which was long, lit by torches, and turning corners. Let's turn the, change the lighting too. There you go. In unexpected places. At last they reached what appeared to be solid wall. Get under here, Harry told Luna, pulling out the invisibility cloak and throwing it over both of them. He gave the wall a little, a little push. It melted away at his touch, and they slipped outside. Harry glanced back and saw that it had re re resealed itself at once. They were standing in a dark corridor. Harry pull, pulled Luna back into the shadows, fumbled in the pouch around his neck, and took out the marauder's map. Holding it close to his nose, he searched and located his and Luna's dots at last. Okay, we're up on the fifth floor, he whispered, watching filth mo uh, Filch moving away from them, a corridor ahead. Come on, this way. They're back at Hogwarts. This is the moment. They're back at Hogwarts. But they're not students. They're sneaking through. They crept off. Jelly Ginny. <laughs> Harry had prowled the castle at night many times before, but never had his heart hammered this fast, never had so much depended on his safe passage through the place. Through squares of moonlight upon the floor, past suits of armor whose helmets creaked at the sound of their fo soft footsteps, around corners beyond which who knew what lurked. Harry and Luna walked, checking the marauder's map whenever light permitted, twice pausing to allow a ghost to pass without drawing attention to themselves. He expected to encounter an obstacle at any moment. His worst fear was peeves and he strained his ears with every step to hear the first telltale, telltale signs of the poltergeist's approach. This way, Harry, breathed Luna, plucking his sleeve and pulling him towards a spiral staircase. They climbed in tight, dizzying circles. Harry had never been here before. At last they reached a door. There was no handle and no keyhole, nothing but a plain expanse of aged wood and a bronze knocker in the shape of an eagle. Luna reached out a pale hand, which looked eerie floating in midair, unconnected to arm or body. She knocked once, and in the silence it sounded to Harry like a cannon blast. At once the beak of the eagle opened, but instead of a bird's call, a soft, musical voice said, Which came first, the phoenix or the flame? Hmm. What do you think, Harry? said Luna, looking thoughtful. Phoenix or the flame? I'm going to try and answer this. Phoenix or the flame? The flame! The flame came first. What? Isn't there just a password? Isn't there just a password? Oh, no. You've got to answer a question, said Luna. What if you get it wrong? Well... You have to wait for somebody who gets it right, said Luna. That way you learn, you see. Y yeah, uh, uh, trouble is we can't really afford to wait for anyone else, Luna. No, I see what you mean, said Luna seriously. Well then, I think the answer is that a circle has no beginning. Well reasoned, said the voice, and the door swung open. It was a, it was a, it was a A or B answer. It wasn't a write-your-own-answer kind of question. All right? That's just some straight-up BS. That's a trick question. I don't appreciate that. All right, so we're at 15 minutes to 7. Again, just reminding you, asking for your help. At what point would be good to, to end? If it's 10 minutes before or five minutes before, anything like that, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you. I am a Gryffindor. Yes, I am. The deserted Ravenclaw common room was a wide, circular room, airier than any Harry had ever seen at Hogwarts. Graceful arched windows punctuated the walls, which were hung with blue and bronze silks. 
By day, the raven claws would have a spectacular, spectacular view of the surrounding mountains. Um, the ceiling was doomed and painting with, painted with stars, which were echoed in the midnight blue carpet. There were tables, chairs, and bookcases. And in, one, and in a niche opposite the door stood a tall statue of white marble. Harry recognized Rowena Ravenclaw from the bust he had seen at Luna's house. The statue stood beside a door which led, he guessed, to dormitories above. He strode right up to the marble woman, and she seemed to look back at him with a quizzical half-smile on her face, beautiful yet slightly intimidating. Okay. She seemed to look back at him with a quizzical half-smile, beautiful yet slightly intimidating. A delicate-looking circlet had been re reproduced in marble on top of her head. It was not unlike the tiara Fleur had worn at her wedding. There were tiny words etched into it. Harry stepped out from under the cloak and climbed up to on to Ravenclaw's plinth to read them. Wit beyond measure is man's greatest treasure. Uh, uh, some kind of voice, a crackling voice. What makes you pretty skint, witless? Said a crackling voice, cackling voice. Oh, cackling, not crackling. Harry whirled round, slipped off the plinth, and landed on the floor. The sloping-shouldered figure of Electo Caro was standing before him, and even as Harry raised his wand, she pressed a stubby forefinger to the skull and snake branded on her forearm. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, man. Chapter 30. The Sacking of Severus Snape. It's going to get fired, huh? All right. This is the end of the chapter. We're 10 minutes away. Should I start another chapter? I'm going to wait a moment to, to hear your responses. I'm going to, only going to read Lois's just in case there's some spoilers and saying, no, this will be good, this will be bad. I'm just going to wait a moment. Um, because, you know, I don't want to get into the thick of things and have to end. And if we end 10 minutes or 5 minutes early, that's okay, right? Because we're still reading throughout Christmas. Probably stop here. Oh, I'm just going to read. Mark says stop here. Uh, okay, so... Mark says stop here. Stop here is good. All right, I'm going to stop here. We're 10 minutes away. I know it's not a full hour, but it is Christmas. Hey, I hope that was good for you. Um, I'm not saying anybody is this way, but a certain amount of um, self-harm and suicide cases do go up during Christmas time. And I'm just saying amongst anybody who's listening here, if you are feeling any of that during Christmas, you are not alone. You are with people. Uh, Feel free to reach out to friends, family, uh, jump on the Discord. If things are difficult for you, send a private message, anything, really. Uh, you are not alone. You are loved. You have a lot of value. You will have a lot of meaning. And uh, take this time to, to, to reach out and reflect. That's, a, that's all I want to say. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Evening and day tomorrow or morning, wherever you are listening to this. It's been such a, a, a pleasure and really a priv privilege to be part of this community that you have, uh, that we have here. Uh, it's It's been really beautiful. I, I know I've received certain messages of thanks for the readings and so on. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this. I do it also that partially that there's selfish reasons in it because I like doing it, but also because I like the community here and you are part of the community. You've built a lot of this. So thank you so much. I love all of you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. Bye-bye.